So hey there, I'm Zedrin. I'm a artist, animator, been doing digital art for probably since I was like 15 or 16, so about like 16 years now, 15 years, somewhere in that range. Started doing animation back in the end of 2011. I like doing stuff featuring sci-fi, fantasy, robot girls, monster girls. I also make a lot of stuff relating to like tabletop games like D&D and Pathfinder. So how I got interested in making art, I kind of always would draw and stuff naturally as a kid. I'm pretty sure a lot of us would do that. I would draw all the time. One of the things that I was super obsessed with was uh, making custom Zoids because I was obsessed with the Zoids anime back when I was a little kid. I also always wanted to be an animator and stuff. I would see animations and stuff on like Newgrounds and like mini clip and things like that. And I really loved them and stuff and I wanted to make them, but I never understood it. And, just kind of con and I just kind of assumed it was beyond me. Though still what I would wind up doing is when I was really young, 13, 12 and stuff, I would actually use PowerPoint and actually make slides of different animation frames. And then I would have them automatically play in a very short time span. And it would basically kind of be like very rudimentary, premature, I mean, very rudimentary animation, usually with like stick figures and stuff. And I would just do this in computer lab after I was done with uh, my assignments and stuff for my computers class in junior high. That's kind of where I got started or got an interest in it. Eventually, I actually kind of moved on playing some online game where uh, you can kind of import your own like textures and models and stuff. Kind of started getting accustomed to that, and that kind of started getting me like in the creative mindset of creating things because I kind of had a knack for that. Eventually, one of my friends gave me a pirated copy of Photoshop, and I used that to start learning how to do things, how to make textures. And then I found out that, oh, hey, people use Photoshop to actually do digital art and draw things. And I saw a tutorial on how to do that. And so I started doing that and then I kind of started to pick it up, learn things and went from just making textures to like doing full drawings and things like that. Fast forward a few years uh, around 2011. That is when I had flash. Eventually I had gotten my own copy of like Photoshop and like the CS5 package and whatever. And it had flash in that, but I never, for I was never able to figure it out. Chris O'Neill, however, also known as Oni had a really concise tutorial on how Flash works, and it was really straightforward. And that was finally the click that kind of like, oh, wait, that's how it works. So I suddenly started animating. And then I gradually just over time just started animating more and more things. I got on board with some project in a fandom and stuff. We banded together with a bunch of people to try and make a movie, which do not try to make a movie for your first animation project. That is like suicide. Shrink the scope down a lot. For some reason, everybody always wants to start with a movie. I had a feeling it probably wasn't going to go through, and this is like a whole story by it itself, but eventually things did fall apart there. Uh, we stayed together and we basically founded a studio for a new studio for the time being that lasted from 2012 to 2015. And then we kind of dissolved that a bit just because like we're all still friends and we talk, but like the studio just wasn't working out. So otherwise, I've just kind of been working independent since then. I guess this also kind of goes into the uh, question of like my origins and stuff as well. Like when I first kind of started figuring out how art works and stuff, I had a deviant art before then, but it was always as a viewer. Um, eventually I started posting my own art and stuff, participating in some fandoms here and there. As far as stuff like deviant art goes and stuff, there's always a ton of drama when it comes to deviant art and stuff, just because a lot of the users on the site are kind of kids. And so they bring kind of childish behavioral patterns there. And I was using it as a kid myself. Constantly would get RP requests. I still get RP requests to this day. Overall, hasn't always been that great, but at least back then, DA was pretty lax on, like, they would kind of leave you alone overall. Modern time, DA is kind of a bit of a different story. First off, they, like, started, like, purging a whole lot of content. Like, a lot of my stuff is retroactively being marked as too mature for the website because they're going off of like one common example is like they keep trying to say that Shantae, for instance, is an underage character. She's not little literally way forward has actually had to come out and state this objectively and say like, no, that's not true. You all are being weird about this. So they were taking down a whole bunch of like Shantae art, for instance. Well, meanwhile, they're just the front page is just still full of a bunch of weird fetish porn and stuff like that. But it's not technically too pornographic, so it's allowed to stay up. So there's that. And then there was also the matter of DA also just like going full on 
balls deep into the whole like NFT AI art stuff. And it's just, it's just disappointing overall. DA has completely fallen a lot by the wayside. I am not regretting leaving that site behind a long time ago. Originally, uh, this is kind of a bit of a doozy and a huge story, but like basically a while back, I had participated a little bit in like the whole MLP fandom or whatever and whatnot at the time. And one of my friends came to me, said, hey, me and this other guy, we're going to make a movie. And so I kind of got on board with it. As I mentioned, I kind of suspected that there was a risk that this was going to fail. But my mentality was like, oh, hey, we're going to try, see how far we can get. If it fails, we'll move on and we'll make smaller stuff because we'll have these connections and we'll have friends and things like that. And it'll be a learning experience. Not so. It didn't exactly last. The director was a little bit of a egomaniac and things like that. Like whenever we would bring up the movie and stuff, they would always have to say, it's my movie and things like that because it was their script or whatnot. But they started dating one of the artists on board on the team. We had employed or we basically had working with we were basically working with this girl and her brother, and they both would share their computer. And there were some really suspicious things about like their origin and stuff. Like they would never speak at the same time. Guess why? Their parents were supposedly dead. Guess why? Then when said director and said person were going to start meeting up and stuff, spontaneously, the girl wound up dying in a car accident due to a drunk duck driver. And so we were all devastated because we thought our friend had died. Director then basically threatened to kill himself over this, use this to get basically information out of the brother, find out that the brother basically never had a sister or whatever. It was just him basically just raising his voice because he was pretty good at and flexible with his voice and doing things like that because he was basically obsessed with said director. Granted, the director basically had convinced all of us that he was basically going to commit suicide. So we were like, yeah, no screw that. We're not participating in any of this. We're all leaving. And so we all left the project and we all regrouped together under a new studio known at the time as like Silly Philly Studios. Uh, We later tried to rebrand, but we did that for a while. Uh, We made like a few pretty notable animations and stuff in that fandom. And I'm not disappointed in the work at all. I do kind of wish that we hadn't like devoted so heavily towards the fandom at the start because uh, ultimately when we tried to move on and try to branch out to do other things, because we all kind of got collectively sick of like the fandom and whatnot and MLP as a whole, it was kind of impossible to move on because names are pretty damn powerful when it comes to like branding and things like that. So as a result, we eventually did wind up shuttering the studio, which was kind of a shame. Shutter that in 2015. We're all still friends. We all still work together, but it's like we're not going to make anything else on that channel whatsoever. There's not really much of a point in it. Honestly, when it comes down to it, like... When it comes to like to MLP, I think really what I wanted was more of like a sense of community and things like that, because like the show itself, it's fine. It's not terrible or anything. It's not something that I would really enjoy in modern times. But like back then, there really wasn't a whole lot of like competition when it comes down to it. And it was really competently written still. So it was still enjoyable, all things considered. Nowadays, it's not the kind of thing that would be in, I would be into at all. And really, when it does come down to it, I was really just kind of desperate for a sense of community and things like that, which is why I've kind of gotten into a lot of fandoms in the past and why I've kind of moved away from fandoms because I'm getting that sense of fulfillment from more genuine relationships, I suppose. Uh, Moving outside of fandom stuff, uh, questions about PVO2 and Pivot and my own creations. Another little story about that. I had basically played Cave Story which is just a small little indie game by Pixel. Back in 2015, I was playing through it. I encountered Curly Brace in the story, and I was like, wow, Curly Brace is really cute. I really like her. I want one. And so I just designed an OC and stuff because, wow, I like robot girls now. And so, yeah, Curly Brace was basically my patient zero, and she uh, kind of infected me. And as a result, now I'm known as the robot guy, I suppose. As far as PVO2 went itself in Pivot, Um, Originally, I kind of just designed the character in a vacuum, and then I was like, hmm, I should make this into like an ask blog or something. So I did, and I started using that to kind of gather up details and stuff, and it was all just sorted, like random, no real cohesion and whatnot. Tried doing a bit of a story for a while, and then I was like, 
hmm, you know, I should pay, probably take this a bit more seriously. So I kind of dropped the Ask Blog aspects and kind of rebooted and made it into an actual webcomic. This was my first time doing like a full on webcomic. It was not easy. Originally, my plan was basically like I was going to use Flash and just do puppet posing and stuff because I was a puppet based animator. So that would allow me to get things done a lot faster. And it worked for a while. And it also allowed me to make assets and stuff. So that way I made, originally made the whole override animation using assets that I had used and been making for uh, the comic itself. And that was going really excellent um, just in terms of a workflow perspective. Eventually, I wanted to move on to a more traditional comic format. And that did slow things down. Really, the hardest part, like, it was always hard when it came to, like, making the comic by the deadline and things like that and getting things ready just because it's a lot of mechanical work. And that kind of does wear you out. But the other thing that also really I struggled with was basically keeping the plot moving forwards and not writing myself into corners because I kept, like, finding plot holes that I had written myself way back and then they came back to haunt me later on and eventually it got so bad that i just could not keep up with it anymore and i had to basically put the comic i basically had to shutter it i've never actually read a whole lot of other web comics and stuff like uh i browsed a few of them here and there but overall it's like i'd never really kept up with any super actively so it was also kind of a lot of a uh, i kind of always felt like a little bit of an island in that respect Maybe I would have had a little bit better luck if I had kind of like studied a few other web comics and things like that and gotten into some more, but I never did. The big thing is that there's kind of two styles of web comics. There's like the continual story ones, like the one that I was doing, and then there's also the uh, flavor of the week kind that are basically just isolated stories like control, alt, delete, and things like that, where those aren't like totally connected and they're a lot easier to kind of output. Granted, I would hope that you put output them with a bit better quality than control, alt, delete, control, alt, delete originally did. Apparently his quality has jumped up, but can't say the same about the writing all that much. But either way, I think really the biggest issue that I kind of had with original PVO2 is just like I kind of would write things that just happen for no reason, where it's like there's no real agency in like the story and Pivot doesn't really feel all that active in what's going on to her. She's reacting to situations, but I want her to be more I wanted her to be more proactive, essentially. I've actually put a whole lot of work into like PVO2 and one of these days I actually do plan to like, I do want to revisit it and completely gut it from the ground up and start over from the beginning and actually like start with a story that actually is consistent with itself because I've put a lot of work into how I would change things and how I would rewrite things. For instance, like I would lean more heavily into like the whole cyberpunk themes because originally I wanted PVO2 to kind of have that whole cyberpunk I couldn't decide if it was going to be cyberpunk or post cyberpunk and I didn't commit to anything. And that was one issue. And it's like, I would want to commit more heavily to the whole cyberpunk element because I want there to be like senses of danger and things like that. Big quandaries that are involved with it. One major change would be like, instead of pivot, just suddenly waking up in this factory arbitrarily, I would want her to essentially be investigating there actively and deciding to go there because there's some reason why she feels drawn to there. And in that process, she winds up screwing something up. And that's where she winds up having to take a more active role in like Vigil, uh, formerly Vigilance, would have renamed it a little bit, and also give Vigil a little bit of a different role. So it's no longer like, oh, hey, they're basically playing a superhero agency. No, instead, they're more of like, hey, they protect the city from things outside the walls, whereas like the police force, quote unquote, protects people from stuff inside the walls, stuff like that. But I don't want to go too much into it because I don't want to like spoil and show my entire hand, but you kind of get what I'm talking about. So as far as aspiring artists would go, um, naturally, the main advice that everybody always says is practice, but make sure you're practicing right, because doing the same thing over and over again that you don't care about or you're doing it wrong is not going to be helpful. Draw what you want and remember that art is not a matter of hey, I put in a bunch of work coins and now I get out progress. So you're only going to get progress if you actually care about what you're making. Really, the entire purpose of art is it's not about a matter of technical skill. What makes good art is art that like is trying to say something or trying to tell a story. Also, it's not trying to actively hurt people and things like that, but that's another matter as well. Art's purpose is basically how well it conveys ideas. 
And this is the whole reason why sometimes you'll get like, oh, hey, I spent like five minutes on a sketch and for some reason this is getting a ton of notes. Meanwhile, this thing that I spent eight hours on is like getting nowhere. Well, it could be that the sketch is just way better at conveying the ideas than the uh, fully rendered piece or that those ideas are just way more relatable. Really, that is the entire purpose of art is basically to try and get ideas across. So that's what you really want to focus on is focus on how you tell a story with your work. Even if it's not technically impressive, if you know how to tell a story right and you know how to make things feel impactful, it'll feel like it's fulfilling. Likewise, when it comes down to it, that is also the reason why Not Safe for Work tends to be more successful than Safe for Work. It's not because Not Safe for Work is like an easy mode or anything. There's a lot of technical aspects that still go into it. It's just Not Safe for Work knows what it wants to be and knows what it wants to do. It's easier in that respect that you don't have to think as much about what it's trying to do. Whereas like if you're trying to do a safer work piece and stuff like that, you got to put more thought into making it interesting and things like that. That said, sometimes I have had some friends who they are really funny and they're really good at doing like safer work pieces and doing comics and things like that. And they get a ton of hits on their work. But then when they try to go to do not safe for work, they have a hard time making it sexy because they can only do funny. And as a result, their not safer work does not do as well as their safer work, and they are confused as hell as why that happens. So yeah, it's not so much black and white. And if you're interested in not safer work, as long as you're approaching it with a healthy mindset and stuff, there's no issue with that. Most artists will probably draw not safer work at some point in their life. Some of the key things, though, that I always advise when it comes to not safer work is everybody should have agency over what they experience and see. And likewise, they shouldn't be able to control what you do. So while you are completely free to make not safer work, just make sure that it's going to the right areas so that way people who don't want to see it aren't feeling subjected to it and things like that. And vice versa, don't let them control you what you're trying to make. Like, it is not their business what you do. Just be mindful of your own work and where you're posting it and what it's saying and generally just try to respect people. The only art I say that is bad art is art that is designed to hurt people. So if you're actively trying to hurt people with art, that is bad art. Doesn't matter whether or not your art is skilled or not, just be chill. Actually, there is something that I kind of want to talk about regarding like feedback and stuff. Really, a lot of people have this misconception that like, oh, hey, you need to sandwich things or like if you're being critical of somebody, it means that you're being truthful, which that's BS. Really, the entire point of critique is understanding what the artist is trying to do and expressing how they can accomplish that either better or what is holding them back from that. A lot of people try to gravitate to very objective things or things that they think are objective, which is why anatomy always gets criticized so much when it comes to like critique. But in reality, if somebody is intentionally like, if you can figure out what their intent is with the piece, you can determine whether or not the anatomy is actually a mistake or if it's a creative liberty as just one example. And like, you have to understand that as a critic, you have to try and figure out what the artist is trying to do before you can give advice. And that is really important. Some people naturally are going to be adverse to advice and stuff like that. And you can't really do too much about that, but you have to assume that artists all have an intent in what they design and you want to try and help them figure out how to realize that intention. So the other thing that people also consider when it comes to uh, art is like, how can you, how can you start monetizing it? And really the biggest pitfall and it's something I still deal with is like monetizing your hobbies really sucks. It's very painful because the thing that you used to love doing now becomes a source of work and you don't really love doing it all that much anymore. Sure. sure sometimes I, there will be things that I want to draw and I get really excited about doing them and I take pride in my craft all the same, whether it's work or for fun, but it's very hard to kind of separate those two now. And that is very frustrating. Like one thing that I kind of do is I kind of separate pieces that I work on into both work pieces, fun pieces, and then things that kind of count for both. Though a lot of things that I do make kind of count for both just because I kind of have the fortune of like a lot of people like me for my own work rather than for like my fan art and things like that. So that is one blessing that I have, uh, though don't expect to get there overnight. The other thing as well to also consider is um, when it comes to like working on your own art as well, make sure that you also still take breaks and stuff and that you take some time to yourself. And this isn't just a matter of like mental health. This is also a matter of like 
hey, your art and your or your hand can only handle doing so many pieces of art per week. And if you are overexerting yourself, I have done this a few times, your hand basically is shot for like two to three weeks and you literally cannot pick up the pencil. And that is incredibly painful and it sucks. And you do not want that to happen. So make sure you're kind of pacing yourself and listen to your body because I would say that the physical ramifications of overworking myself were far worse than the mental ramifications. The mental ones I can get over in a few days. The physical ones take me a few weeks. Granted, I'm older than I was back then, so I'm a little bit more sensitive to physical trauma, I would suppose. But still, if you're young and you're starting out doing art, still make sure you're not overworking yourself and listen to your body. If your hand starts cramping up, just stop drawing for the night. You've done enough. One other thing that I'll also kind of mention that's weird about art, the better you get at it, the less time you have to work on it, which is odd. As you get better, your work will get more skilled and you'll also get faster. So you can render out something that is more valuable in a less amount of time. So that is another thing that I'll also mention is don't rate your work necessarily in hourly wages just kind of gets weird. Like you should be at least making minimum wage for time spent on art. As you get better, it's just weird how it works out and stuff. Like in some cases, you might have some pieces of work where you're essentially making like the equivalent of like $120 an hour just because you're able to get exactly what's needed done in a very reasonable amount of time. So yeah, uh, make sure you're rating yourself appropriately when it comes to that kind of thing, because it's it's a weird situation, and it's not something that you can just make a blanket statement on. You probably know how much you're worth. If you're getting a lot of commissions, chances are you should raise your rates. On the concept of making money and things like that, um, it's very good to also like diversify your sources of income. A lot of my income comes from Patreon, for instance, and it's displayed publicly. It's usually around like 2000 a month or something like that. Patreon sometimes does make a few questionable decisions. So I also have like backup sources, such as I have a subscribe star. I also make money from YouTube. I also have like a Gumroad, which I kind of need to port over because I don't really agree with the uh, founder of Gumroad kind of violating users' privacy, which is a bit of a mess. There's like itch.io and things like that. There's coffee. There's a bunch of different sources where you can make income. And then of course, there's also just like PayPal and stuff for doing commissions. You're really going to have to understand what's right for you. Uh, if you think you can do animation and you think you have interesting ideas and stuff, YouTube can also be a really good source for stuff, even if it's like lightly animated stuff. Remember, people really like stories overall. And if you can basically make content that's funny, relatable, stuff like that, people will eventually find it and flock to it. When it comes to YouTube, probably don't do what I do, where I kind of have one channel that I just dedicate to literally everything that I care about and want to do. So as a result, my YouTube channel has stuff about art advice and tutorials. It has animation stuff. It has assorted animations like Hero of the Dens and Override. Uh, it has comic dubs. It has videos on D&D and Pathfinder. And I love all these things. But as a result, it's not as focused. So my viewership kind of fluctuates a lot. So it's not all that stable. I kind of still rely on a few big hitters that I've made in the past, which make up most of my YouTube uh, revenue and income, like Hero of the Dents, for instance. One final tip I will give when it comes to things like Patreon and Substar. Be very, very cautious about doing personalized rewards, and I would not recommend including them in the tier itself. Because if you're basically doing this, you're essentially guaranteeing somebody a commission at a stable, consistent, constant rate. And you will eventually advance to a point where that is no longer worthwhile for you. Like, I originally had like a $10 sketch tier. My sketches go for way more than that nowadays. So it didn't make sense for me to keep that as a reward for the $10 tier and stuff, especially because I kept having people pour in and it just got to be impossible for me to manage. Things like that don't scale well, and you want to avoid rewards for tiers that just don't scale and stuff. Like, sure, you can maybe handle it if it's like five people in a tier, but can you handle it if, it, if, if it's 50 people in a tier? Always ask yourself that question when you're doing rewards. So as far as like online communities go and stuff, um, I've talked about DeviantArt a bit, so I won't say any more on them because DeviantArt just has manager management issues up and down, left and right. Newgrounds is a great alternative to that just because Newgrounds 
is managed by humans and stuff rather than by algorithms. And it doesn't have like investors and things like that. It's taken a stand against AI art and things like that. So Newgrounds really does have your back. When it comes to like managing a community over Discord, the big problem with Discord is that it is, it is isolated. It's a walled garden kind of thing. You can only access content from Discord servers if you're on that server. That is not a good way to manage your art overall, and it's not a good way to build an online presence. Conversely, Twitter is way better for that. The problem is that it's ran by Elon Musk, and he really does not know what he's doing. He doesn't really know what he's doing ever. He's just kind of bought people to say that they that he does know what he's doing, but he really doesn't, and he's made that abundantly clear. He's an idiot. I want to stress with everybody here. Elon Musk is an idiot. I'm sorry you had to find out this way. But now, the thing with Twitter is that a lot of it is still kind of... It has a similar issue to Discord where it's kind of transient and stuff like that, where it's not going to stay fixed, and it doesn't have a good log of your stuff. The flip side, however, is that Twitter is really good for making reach and stuff like that. So I really wouldn't use Twitter as like a gallery. I would kind of combine it with something else like a Pixiv or DeviantArt or Newgrounds. And I know I said I don't like DeviantArt, but it still is a gallery more than anything. Each social media site can kind of fall into like either it's a social site or it's a gallery site when as far as artists are concerned. And you really want at least one of both. Tumblr was interesting in that respect because while it was a social site, it had some features in it that were really great for gallery preservation and stuff like that. Like you could search back post archives and stuff. There was a, gr a great tagging system on that platform. You could post up to 10 images in a post. All that stuff was excellent. And then they decided, hey, uh, we're going to kick off no more porn, no more not safe for work because uh, we don't know. And then they booted off like 80% of their user base. So some good experiences that I've had with friends. Well, I did kind of mention the whole thing with the studio and how we had to deal with a faked suicide. How that kind of all caused us to break off and form our own studio. And that really kind of really strengthened the bond that we all had together because we had all gone through that experience and stuff. We all kind of are essentially inseparable now, even if we're all kind of off doing our own things. We're still all going to be really close friends. Beyond that, I also have other friends and things like that. People I've met through communities that I've been a part of or that I founded myself. Really, when you're an artist specifically, one of the easiest ways you can make friends with other artists is just by doing like things like art trades and stuff. You like their characters, get invested in their characters. I don't know if I'm really the best person to also give advice as far as making friends go, because most of the friends that I've made have been friends that I was introduced to through other friends, or like I got invited to a community ran by another friend and then I made friends through there. I just kind of exist. I'm always the kind of person as well who's like, I enjoy group situations more than one on one just because I can kind of linger and kind of can lurk a little bit when it comes to like communities and stuff. I can just chill out, uh, enter into a conversation if I see it's something that I know something about or can participate in. Whereas if it's one on one, there's a lot more pressure on me to like directly engage with the person. And so it's like, I feel like awkward silences wind up becoming my fault. It's less of an issue if it's in a group setting and stuff, because then other people can kind of step in, step out, etc. It's not seen as uh, much as poor form. So yeah, that's my preference overall, I would say, when it comes to meeting new people and making friends is I kind of just prefer participating in groups. I have not been impersonated a whole lot, though it has happened in the past. Generally, I'm pretty straightforward about it. I'll confront the person if it's on the same platform that I'm on, or I'll make big statements on the platforms that I am on that, hey, this person here is not me. Do not trust their work. Uh, if I have to, I'll file a DMCA about it. I'm not afraid to file those. I mean, that's really all you really can do about it. Just clarifying with people and stuff and just trusting that your audience has the intelligence to know where to find you for real and know to trust you specifically and not a copy. I mostly stream on Picardo. They've been having a bit of issues with it lately, so I don't know if that's going to change in the future or not. Generally, the biggest piece of advice I can give if you're going to stream is try to do it regularly and at roughly the same time. That's kind of been screwed up a little bit for me because after I have moved recently, my sleep schedule accidentally got fixed, so I can't stream at the usual times that I used to anymore. So I've been streaming earlier than that. 
but I still try to stream on the same days as usual. And just keeping that consistent is probably the most important thing. If people kind of get into a rhythm of expecting you to be online at a certain time, they will start showing up more and more regularly. As far as things like Twitch goes, you also want to make sure that you're kind of paying attention to people and you're interacting with others, which is something that I'm really bad at. I don't usually enjoy streaming to Twitch because, or at least when it comes to art, because I get focused on my own work and people expect me to talk to them in stream chat. That's easier for me to do when I'm playing like a game, like I've been streaming Death Stranding lately. Not as easy when it comes to uh, doing art. Overall, one thing that I would recommend, though, if you're going to be doing art is try to find a few friends and stuff who don't mind being in a stream with you and get into a Discord call and just chat with them as you're working and they can help you stay focused. Like for me, that actually helps me a whole lot because it allows me to stay motivated because I'm kind of getting like social fulfillment, I suppose, while I'm working. And if I'm just working by myself, mostly in silence for a long period of time, then it kind of starts to wear on me. But that's also just me. You might be different. But yeah, overall, just try to stay focused and try to stay consistent with what you're doing. I've appeared on like Rubber Ross's streams and stuff. We were doing like a artist Arctic phone and stuff. A bunch of artists he basically had contacted from Twitter. I remember one thing that was kind of funny was uh, he basically made a bet saying like, hey, if you can make me laugh in this Gardic phone thing, I will send you 50 bucks. And I was one of two winners in that. So that felt good. I think I drew, I think it was Thomas the Tank Engine and something else, like just making out. And it was hell, and it was funny. As far as some other people who I've interacted with um, at conventions and stuff, I got to meet Tom Wayland a bit. Um, more of the other people in my studio and stuff at the time, they got to actually... They actually kind of interacted with him a little bit more, but that was always really fun and stuff. Like, I still remember uh, one of my friends, Jen, we were at a panel and stuff where it was like, hey, try voicing these Pokemon things. And like, you put up some uh, some Pokemon clips up on the screen and stuff and have people in the audience basically just like record a voice acting thing. And he had one thing for like uh, Mewtwo coming up. And Jen, my friend, She's really short, so he was expecting her to have this like tiny voice, but she is a really great voice actor. Uh, she goes up to the microphone and starts bringing out this like deep, like very mature voice from you two and stuff that's very on the spot for it and like very accurate. And then Tom Wayland just kind of like he just kind of leans back and he's like kind of wide eyed for a moment, like whoa, that was a very funny experience. That was at a uh, Yomacon a few years back. And if you don't know, Tom Wayland is basically the guy who was responsible for handling the voice casting for Pokemon for while it was in Four Kids and then a little while after that, I believe. He was with that from 2008 to 2015 overall. So regarding TTRPGs, uh, my first experience actually was uh, playing a 3.5 game that a friend of mine was running. I like to jokingly refer to it as the time we pretended to play 3.5. That's where one of my characters actually originally came from because I was playing a Drider Alchemist, which A, playing a Drider, of course it's a monster race, it's 3.5, everybody plays monsters, and B, Alchemist is not a class in that system, so we kind of were using a Humber one that didn't have any rules for it whatsoever, so didn't really know what we were doing here. It kind of ended with us being level 5 and fighting a level 17 dragon that somehow managed to die in one hit because the bard managed to roll a 17 on the die. Made no real sense, but it was fun. Uh, later on, we kind of started moving into doing like 5e and stuff. Again, didn't really know the rules at that time. Uh, it was a game being ran by my friend Garretts. Eventually, that kind of crumbled just due to a uh, scheduling issue. Eventually, he later brought back the campaign and we revisited it. And that campaign lasted like five years, going all the way from like level one all the way to level 20. I started out playing a druid. Uh, there was kind of two campaigns for that. Uh, halfway At the halfway point and stuff, basically that campaign closed. And then the next one started and we could swap out characters if we wanted. I brought, my, brought back my character from the first one, who was a Dragonborn fighter. And that was from the one that previously failed due to scheduling issues. And then I saw them through to the very end. And that was, it was fantastic. That game was so much fun. The stories in it were so good. I still have them all memorized and things like that. All the little details and all the events. And we have it logged out because we've written up journals and stuff. Just some highlights of the final fight. It ended with us essentially trying to interrupt these lizard folk cultists from summoning Sesenek, which is the dark lizard folk god, into the world to try and eat things and kill everyone. We failed to stop that. 
However, right as he spawned, our artificer managed to basically call in an orbital bombardment from a relic satellite that was literally from another dimension and stuff, another world. We managed to somehow get access to it, called down a orbital bombardment on the god to cut down only half of its health and piss it off even more. So uh, in that fight, my character, Lishna, who is the Dragonborn fighter, actually wound up being decapitated at the last round of combat because they had a Vorpal sword and they managed to get a crit right at the very end. And it was so dramatic because like right after that happened, it was on its last legs and the rest of the party managed to finish it off. And then they were too cheap to revive me. So that instead they used, uh, they decided to use, um, what was it called? Repose, gentle repose to preserve my corpse, waited a day. So that way they could get spells back. And then they could just use wish to cast, um, basically cast the resurrection spell for free as a result and basically bypass uh, a lot of the monetary costs of it. You know, I would be mad, but considering I was playing a dragonborn, she was fine with the concept of saving money. Really overall, when it comes to like how to run a good game in D&D, the key thing that I would say is make sure that your players have agency. Make sure that you're not putting them in situations where they feel like they cannot win or can't decide what to do. Like, it can be a bad situation, and it can be a situation where it's like things are stacked against them, but it sucks if you have a situation where, say, the party's walking along, they one of the party members randomly gets hit by a surprise attacker, it's a sneak attack, or it's a, and it's a critical hit, and it immediately just downs them in one turn before they get to act. That kind of shit sucks, and you should absolutely try to avoid that where it can happen. That's just one example. Because it's not like they had a chance to basically retaliate or dodge or anything like that. It just happens out of the blue. And avoid situations like that. Other situations as well as like, try to work with your players and stuff. And if they have ideas on how to approach a situation or come up with a solution, try to figure out what parts of that work. And let some of it work out, even if not all of it will work. And if it won't like necessarily change what's about to happen. Remember, you're working with your players to tell a good story. You are not the enemy, if you're a DM. I've relearned Blender like 10 times so far, and I've forgotten most of it. I forget most of it every single time afterwards, so it's kind of a frustrating cycle for me. I guess the only advice that I can really give on it is stick with it and watch those tutorials and stuff. Um, I really like Blender Secrets and Royal Skies for two channels and stuff that have really great tutorials, namely because they're bite-sized and they show one operation that is specific to what I'm trying to do, rather than a 30-minute video that is 20 minutes of stuff I already know, five minutes of stuff that I don't care about, and five minutes of stuff that I actually am trying to figure out. Try to find good tutorials, basically. That's the only thing that I can suggest. I am not an experienced 3D user. So, elements that I like in art. Overall, um, as I've mentioned, Art's purpose is to basically convey an idea to somebody, so I like stuff that has a lot of personality to it. Sometimes that might come out in the artist's style and things like that. Sometimes it might come out in like how they'd handle their proportions or their angles and perspective, or it just might be the character design and stuff, but it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly what I like in art because everything that goes into making art is unique and interesting in its own way, and depending on how it's handled always has a big impact on things. Probably the biggest influence on my art style has been Studio Trigger slash uh, Gainax, specifically Hiroyuki Yamashi. Everybody always says that. Everybody loves Studio Trigger in their art style and things like that. But like Panty and Stocking, for instance, was a big influence on me. A lot of stuff that Trigger has made, like Kill a Kill, I still adore Kill a Kill and stuff like that. Madoka Magica also had a big influence on me. That is That was by Shaft and Jen, Oro Jen Orobochi. As you can tell, I, a lot of anime has influenced me uh, over these past few years. It's kind of funny, actually. Um, before I started kind of getting into anime, that was back when I was into the whole like MLP stuff. I had to relearn how to draw humans. I went. That is actually one regret that I actually have about the whole MLP thing is that it kind of sabotaged my art progress. Uh, I kind of forgot how to draw because of it. I'm better now. I fixed myself. Trigger is overall just has been a fantastic influence on me, and I love their work. The last thing I watched by them was uh, Cyberpunk Edge Runners, which that was a excellent anime, very good, and it was interesting because it kind of combined like Trigger's personality and style with a lot more grounded writing and stuff from like a more from like a Western author. Because like Trigger's stuff, they kind of get a bit absurd at the end usually, 
where things like often end up in space or become like they basically embody the whole like careless indifference of the universe versus the indomitability of the human spirit. They are that personified and I eat that shit up, but also I can appreciate more grounded and more like realistic and hard to swallow stories like cyberpunk edge runners and stuff like that. Namely, because those kinds of stories are important. That said, I will quickly say that Darling in the Franks does not count as a Trigger anime, and neither does Trigger consider it such. That was mostly done by a Shaft and people trying to copy Trigger's style. And then they plastered Trigger's name all over the advertising to try and sell it more because they knew it would sell more. But Trigger really did not care much for that project. I will say that. As far as advice on life that I will offer, the big thing that I would say is try to make the world a bit better and stuff like that. Like, try to have some positive influence at least. Really live and let live, ultimately. And I guess not just stop there. You really kind of want to make sure that you're allowing other people to live and let live as well. Like, I feel it's important to kind of take a stand for people who can't really necessarily speak up for themselves or who need help and support. So while it's good not to leave the world worse off than you encountered it, it's also good to leave it better than you encountered it. The big advantage that Newgrounds has kind of had for me overall is that it's a gallery site. It has a pretty good tagging system and things like that. But most importantly, it's a site that's basically curated by humans overall, and it is it has always basically been independent of investors and things like that. It always basically puts its users first more than anything. Newgrounds is one of the few places where it's like I can still share my not safe for work projects and stuff in full, which is great. It's part of why I'm kind of disappointed in the way direction Twitter's going, because like Twitter is one of the few social sites where I can still do that kind of stuff. Newgrounds is one of the few places where I can do that stuff as a gallery site. And I don't have any concerns about Newgrounds going away anytime soon. Still, Newgrounds has been very important and stuff. It's kind of basically like a creative collective, and it also has a lot to offer for people who aren't creators as well, which is just as important because an art site really isn't anything if there's not an audience there as well. I don't really schedule my day. I kind of have like one key thing that I plan to do each day, even if that thing is just like relax or just play some games. Sometimes it varies a little bit. Usually like Friday, Sunday, and Tuesday are three days where I basically plan, hey, I'm going to stream at some point during this day, probably more in the evening. Thursday, I usually have planned out like, hey, this is the day that I'm going to be GMing. And then the other days are kind of up in the air. Today, for instance, is kind of a little bit messy because it's like I'm recording this and then I've also got a stream later and then I'm also going to hang out with a few friends later and I might have to move something over to another time because I'm going to run out of time and stuff like that. I just kind of always play it by ear and stuff. Uh, one advantage of basically working completely self-employed, basically making a living off my art, is that I can change my schedule at a drop of a hat. For streaming and stuff, it's still as good to keep a consistent schedule, but I, it's, again... You can you have a bit of leeway on that and stuff. You can adjust things as you need. You can do makeup days and things like that. Overall, I think the biggest thing that I kind of wish that I had known earlier in life was just that I actually wanted to go into what I am doing today. Because originally I was I was always like one of those smart kids. I was actually valedictorian of my high school. I graduated summa cum laude from my college. I really liked doing art. But because I was so smart, I had this pressure on me to go into some kind of STEM field. So I was going to become an engineer. Uh, my high school had a engineering program and stuff for high school students and stuff where you basically got to get a crash course and that kind of thing. That was fun and all. Like I got to play around with robotics and stuff, got to do some AutoCAD stuff. And then I went into college and stuff and I started going through things and it just started kind of draining on me and weighing on me uh, by sophomore year in college. That's when we kind of had the studio kind of launching and we had basically broken off and kind of started things there. And that's when I kind of realized, you know, I could just do art full time. And so I quit my job at the uh, I quit my job. I was working at a movie theater at the time, quit that, started making art, doing animations and stuff, started earning money from YouTube, started making money from commissions. And that basically kind of allowed me to make my living and stuff while I was in college. I didn't drop out of college or anything. I finished my degree four years. A mechanical engineering degree, graduated summa cum laude, as I said. It's just, I really wish that I had known more what I wanted to do early on. Because like, even if I stayed in a STEM field, if I had pivoted to something like programming or computer science, 
that at least would have had some relation to what I am doing now and would have been more useful than understanding building structural dynamics and things like that. Really, when it came down to it, mechanical engineering wound up not being what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like doing robotic stuff, making like mechanical parts and stuff. Now, most of it was about like, had a lot of tie into civil engineering stuff, oddly enough, but like most of it had to do with like understanding stress and pressure and heat and stuff like that. And it just, that kind of just killed a lot of my interest in it. Really, the most interesting thing about my college degree and stuff that I had studied was A, the stuff about like renewable engineering and how that actually works, and B, material science. Those two things were super interesting to me, but I really wish that I had gone into like comp science said, because again, it would have just been useful. I could have been potentially doing game design right now. It is what it is, and it's not like I can't teach myself that stuff. That's another thing that I would also advise for life is always be willing to try and learn new things. That's kind of super generic, but still. I know 2D stuff. I've learned animation. I know both frame by frame and puppet based. Um, I've learned how to do that live 2D stuff. I just haven't done it, but I know how to do it. I've made a April Fool's model for myself. I'm learning 3D once again. No matter how many times I forget it, I will always be back. I know a little bit of programming. A uh, fun fact, actually, that one game that I had mentioned a long time ago had its own programming language as well, so you could basically program your own stuff, and I did a whole lot of programming in that. I've kind of forgotten most of it, but I want to revisit it. Eventually, I want to do game design and stuff again, and who knows, maybe in the future that'll change. So as far as useful art and animation tutorials that I can recommend, um, if you're working in Adobe Animate or Flash, I still recommend Chris O'Neill's tutorials because they're really straightforward in like explaining how exactly tweened animation works, and they're really good at that. I've done some tutorials myself and such. Mine usually focus more on like a specific aspect of animation. I have one tutorial, for instance, that's about like how to nest animation and what that actually means and how it can basically optimize your workflow so that way your timeline's cleaner. And that's for like Flash. But then I also have stuff that's like, hey, this is more of a general animation principle on like how to get smoother animation and how to like approach animating with the like the right mindset and stuff. And that applies to anything. And then of course I also have some comprehensive tutorials on like how CSP works and how to use that for animation. Ultimately, you want to try and find a tutorial that's like fits your style. Because everybody, when they're learning and stuff, they're going to have a different starting point, really. If you know all about how Flash works, but you don't really know a lot about like animation principles, you probably want to study stuff on animation principles. Like there's even um, the 12 principles of animation or whatever, uh, which is a book, which has also been made into a video and stuff. And that's a really good thing to watch. Uh, I'm going to skip the question on image board culture because I actually have nothing to do with that. I don't know anything about like I've been on 4chan maybe like three times in my life. I this is not something that I really can answer anything about because I don't really know anything about it. As far as what I have experienced, though, it has mostly been through screenshots grabbed from image boards and stuff. And that's mostly what I've interacted with. For instance, that's how I kind of got the idea for Hero of the Dense and Hero of the Dense 2. Originally, there was an 8chan board that was like a um, it was entertaining the thought of like having an incredibly dense shonen protagonist and stuff who was basically being approached by like a demon or succubus and everything, and they were trying to seduce him and they weren't successful at it. Um, originally, they had kind of a lot of the threads and stuff in there were actually making him more like just kind of flustered, I suppose, and a little bit more aware. So I kind of made a few changes of my own with my own interpretations and such like the original scripts made the succubus or the demon queen kind of bratty and things like that and juvenile. And I've kind of split that into two characters. I had Isolith and then I had the demon queen and stuff. As I said, they kind of made the protagonist a little bit more like just shy overall. And instead, I just made him really stupid and really dense, which was funny. Episode two was more just kind of going by my own ideas and stuff like that and had less inspiration from the original thread and things like that and was more just me 100%. The big thing with Hero of the Dense overall is that I originally did it in a way that I was trying to like cut a lot of corners and in cutting corners, I just wanted to make it more work for myself. Toon Boom can be a little bit weird to work with sometimes. My corner cutting techniques probably work would have worked better in like Flash, but not so much in Toon Boom. And as to why that is, is kind of hard to explain. I do have to say I did enjoy animating the titty physics. However, I probably would not be able to get away with that in modern YouTube's climate because, uh, They've been getting a lot more strict on that, which probably has basically effectively killed the concept of making a third one. 
which was already kind of up in the air about things. And I don't know, YouTube is just way too much of a uh, wild card at this point for me to feel safe doing that. I'm not going to spend like six months working on an animation just for it to get demonetized. So as far as what makes a good tutorial, the most important thing really is that it is, well, first off, the information has to be accurate and it has to be like concise. So there's always a balancing act because some people might find something that is concise enough and easy to understand, whereas other people might find that it is too fast and goes too quickly and they don't understand it. So it all kind of depends on your speed. Different tutorials will work for different people overall. As long as the information is accurate, that's the most important thing. Generally, a good tutorial can identify and cut out as much fluff as it feels like it needs to. Likewise, this is my opinion, but I enjoy tutorials that have a bit of humor or personality to them and stuff. Just as long as it's not to the detriment of the rest of the tutorial or the information and stuff like that. As far as the Curly Braced Hack series goes, funnily enough, the first one was actually my first like big experiment with a project in Toon Boom, because I had gotten Toon Boom earlier that year, and um, it was basically my first time making a full animation with it. Overall, I've kind of felt some pressure to just kind of continue the series and stuff because people keep begging for it and things like that. Though every single time that I've kind of released it, it's kind of been more to like not as in not as much of an invested reaction as I had hoped each time. So I don't know if I'm going to I don't think I'm going to continue it really. Big animation projects, especially like not safer work ones, are kind of a headache to work with. I'm much more partial to doing stuff like small animation loops and GIF animations and short animations that are like maybe 30 seconds long rather than full on four minute things. And the other thing that's also really annoying is just how many children have basically kind of replied on my Newgrounds account on the videos and stuff. They're very obviously minors, and I just kind of wish that they would go away. Just let me animate my titties in peace. Aside from them, there's also you occasionally get the whole like people who are coming onto Newgrounds just flame people. So that's obnoxious. Uh, usually I just report them when they show up. Um, sometimes I'll look at their account and see if it's like a serial behavior, and if it is, I'll file a few more reports there and things like that. And that's essentially how I got the bronze whistle on new grounds, which isn't that big of a deal. Yeah, just keeping an eye out for flamers and stuff and deal with them then. So as far as interacting with a fan base, most people suggest that you don't. I am not like most people. However, overall, generally, you should probably keep them at arm's length just because you don't want to get into any parasocial involvement, which isn't good. But overall, as long as you're not like being disrespectful and you're also not taking disrespect and stuff, that's kind of just a two-way street, just treat them like you would anybody else. Uh, if they get really obsessed or interested in you, then you do need to set boundaries, though, and make sure that your boundaries are respected. And of course, like, if you get fan art and stuff like that, you should always be gracious about it, unless it's, like, something that is clearly over the line. Like, I have gotten some fan art before where somebody was, like, injecting his fetishes into, like, my characters and stuff like that, and that was getting really weird, and it was going places that I didn't like. I'm also kind of not really a fan of like people shipping themselves or their characters with mine and things like that it feels a little weird. But beyond that, I try to appreciate any fan art that I see and try to at least respond or like share it and things like that. And it goes into my big old folder. I got a big old folder on my hard drive that is full of fan art and things like that. Um, if you are popular enough where you're getting fan art and stuff, it is good to maybe have like somewhere on one of your socials where you just kind of clarify like what you're comfortable with and what you're not like I have a little guide um, about like what I'm used to and what I'm not used to I kind of actually have like a uh, list of all my characters and stuff with all the character designs and each one has a brief description about like the limits and taboos and what to do what not to do etc I do have a pitch bible for PVO2 well not so much a pitch bible but just like a production bible for whenever I do plan to like reboot it. I'm not going to share too much about that just because a lot of it I want to keep secret and under wraps. The original webcomic and stuff had issues where like, I think I mentioned this in an earlier recording, but things just kind of arbitrarily happened and they didn't have any purpose or rhyme or reason behind it. So largely my reformatting of everything has been A, make the world a lot more concrete and specific and involved. B, make sure that things actually feel like they're happening for a reason and that like pivot is reacting to things and taking action on things with purpose. See, so kind of lean more heavily into the whole cyberpunk themes and stuff, because that was always kind of a backdrop, but I never really fully committed to it. 
for instance, just as far as like the setting goes, one major change that I want to make is um, overall, a lot of society has kind of like moved into these mega cities and stuff, which um, as basically as a means to kind of counteract like environmental damages and things like that, because the world has kind of gone to hell in a handbasket, but nobody would really be aware of this because there's essentially like big electromagnetic or there's these big um, sci-fi technology nets that kind of help keep the atmosphere clean and stuff inside the city, help make the sky appear as if it's blue. And then if you go outside the city, you see that the sky is just kind of hazy and everything is kind of like a bit inhospitable, things like that. And usually because there's so much pollution and kind of radiation outside the city walls, usually you have like androids and bots who are basically sent out to do tasks outside the city walls. Humans can go outside them as well, but usually they don't because of health complications and also it's just way safer in the city and way more comfortable. But one major element that will also come up is there'd be a faction of essentially machines that are known as glitches, which essentially think of them kind of like rogue AIs that are all operating on the same network as a single hive mind. And they're like a major problem. And the entire purpose of Pivot and her organization and the one that she's a part of is they're essentially tracking the glitch movements and making sure that they're not attacking the city. And if they do attack the city or mobilize to attack the city, they're kind of the first line of defense. I think this is better than having vigilance or vigil being like a security force within the city because uh, it seemed a little arbitrary and it seemed like I was just kind of copying Hero Acad My Hero Academia or whatever or those other superhero kind of things. And that's not really what I wanted to go for. It wasn't ever really supposed to be like a superhero comic. And then another major change would be that Pivot starts out working for Vigil. And um, she's essentially a communication. So she's essentially part of like Overwatch and she's just monitoring things using what she was basically built for and tracking that kind of information and tracking movements and things like that. And then when something winds up happening, she winds up being put into a more active role where she's actually boots on the ground kind of fighting alongside things. But that's about all I'm going to share about that topic because I kind of want to keep my cards close to my chest on this because, again, it's it's something that's really important to me and I don't want to spoil too much about it. Closing thoughts here. There is one thing that I will kind of say that is a little bit of a bitter pill to swallow. When it comes to art, naturally, you always got to practice and things like that. A lot of people wonder why their work doesn't get popular. And again, it comes down to basically understanding what your art is trying to say and the ideas that you're trying to convey. If your art isn't getting numbers, it might be because you're not saying anything interesting. And that is kind of the bitter pill to swallow and stuff, because it might not be your quality of work. It might just be that you're not interesting or not interesting yet, or you don't know how to be interesting. And maybe you can fix that. But as soon as you kind of identify the problem, you can kind of level up. As far as advancing and learning and stuff, always be trying to figure out new approaches to the way that you handle things, not only just like, because you don't want to just practice all the time and practice the same things and then wonder why you're not improving. Really, when it comes down to it, people kind of will teeter off and stop improving after a certain point unless they can figure out a new approach to, to things and stuff. Like Healthy Gamer had a little bit on this where he was kind of comparing it to like, hey, if you're playing like competitive games and stuff, are you somebody who's basically playing four hours a day and stuff to like practice and things like that? Or are you somebody who's like actually going in and watching your replays and stuff, seeing where you made mistakes? Are you watching other people who basically are higher level than you and seeing what they do and emulating that? And it's kind of like the difference between those two. One person is still practicing just as much, but the other person is going to advance faster just because he's putting in more diverse work. And the same also applies to like art and stuff. Like try to figure out other ways and stuff to basically learn ways to get feedback and things like that. If you haven't been improving, maybe you just need to change up your approach and stuff. The good news is that when it comes to this kind of thing, it's usually just working smarter, not harder. That's generally good advice in general, is uh, work smarter, not harder. Don't despair, just always look inward and try to always just focus on doing things that you enjoy. Because if you're passionate about it, chances are other people will be as well. Granted, not everybody's going to want to hear your entire OC's backstory that's like 16 pages, at least until they actually can get invested in it. So you have to make sure that it's palatable.